Welcome to the first session of VVMAT 2, the PhD sessions. As an opening speaker, I chose Tobias Brink from the Max Planck Institute for Eisenforschung. First, it's because he's one of our more senior postdocs. And second, it's because his talk will revolve around MD simulations, which is a bit of a hobby of mine. Tobias got his PhD in 2016 from the TU Darmstadt under the supervision of Karsten Albe where he used MD to study the mechanical properties of metallic glasses and composites. He then spent three years as a postdoc with Jean-Francois Molinari at the EPFL, uh, studying wear particle formation using MD and continuum methods. Since 2020, he is at the Max Planck Institute for Eisenforschung in Düsseldorf, where he recently started his own work group, studying grain boundaries and interfaces. If you have any questions for Tobias, please post them in the comment section below the video. Before we listen to his talk, let's hear a short message from our sponsor. Codings is a peer-reviewed journal of codings and surface engineering published online by MDPI on a monthly basis. And now, we're lost! So today I'm going to talk about our efforts to base wear laws on physical mechanisms with simulations from the nanoscale and the mesoscale. This work has mostly been done during my postdoc at EPFL together with former doctoral students Luca Frerot and Enrico Milanese in the lab of Jean-François Molinari. We were concerned with dry adhesive wear to keep it simple and I'm going to introduce a little bit how that works. So you have two bodies, you put them in contact with a normal force Fn and then you slide them against each other. And we know experimentally that that leads to loss of volume over time. And we also know experimentally that this volume loss is in the form of wear particles that form on the surfaces. Um, and you can see here an example from, from some experiment, but they are all over the literature. Since the last century and before, it is known that wear is a quite linear process. So you are linear to the sliding distance. This is probably not so surprising, but you're also linear to the normal load Fn inversely proportional to the hardness in many wear laws. For example, here Archard's wear law that I show here. But then you're always missing something. You have a parameter, for example, here this k, uh, which is a proportionality constant. But this proportionality constant here, the wear coefficient, um, can take many values over several orders of magnitude. And we can't really predict it very well, or at all. And we also don't really know what it is. Archard proposed it's sort of a probability for wear particle formation but still we cannot predict what this probability is. So if we zoom into the micro scale, these surfaces that are in contact are always rough and they're always in contact only at certain spots on the surface. And this is marked here in red. And our view on wear particle formation is that you assign to each of these junctions a size. If you make it very simple, you just take a diameter D and then you can use some very simple linear elastic fracture mechanics arguments, which you can find in the paper cited below, for example. I'm not going to go into too much detail today. But what you find is that there is a sort of critical size for this contact. If the contact is smaller than this critical size, you will not be able to detach a wear particle because for that you need to form a crack. And if you don't have enough elastic energy to do that, you cannot. And if your contact is too small, that's what happens. Your contact is big enough, you have enough elastic energy stored uh, during sliding, and then you can make a crack and detach the particle. So how can we get to wear law? We can try something like Bowden and Tabor's uh, model for friction of metals. And here we say for a single contact, the force, the tangential force at this contact is going to be the shear strength of, shear strength of the contact tau times the area of this contact, approximated here just as d squared. Very crude. And then what you can do is you can get from friction to work by integrating over a sliding distance. And what is the sliding distance you need to detach a particle? Well, it's going to be approximately equal to the diameter of the contact. That seems quite reasonable. So we have this then we can assume that the particle that forms has a diameter also somewhat equal to d, and then we can form, uh, reformulate this equation like this. And then we get something that looks uh, a lot like Archard's wear law. Except we're missing this wear coefficient. Well, 
if we say that's a particle formation probability, our probability in this case is 1 because we already fulfilled our criterion here. But if we want to look at a big surface, we have many contacts. And if we don't know what contacts we have at a given time, we still don't know what the macroscopic wear volume is going to be over long sliding distances. So we are back to putting a K there. Furthermore, in this view, there's still a lot of simplifications. For example, the frictional force FT is not only going to be due to particle formation, there are other mechanisms, and we don't know in what relation these are going to be. Also, if a particle forms, well, we have a certain wear volume, but due to this particle, but this particle might change its shape, it might pick up more material, it might deposit material. So how does that contribute? Also, again, we want to know our K. We don't want to have some sort of fit parameter. We want to know what this K is, and that has to be related to somehow the topology of the surface and how do these contacts, how many contacts do we have, what shape do the contacts have. And the last two points is what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to start at the nanoscale. At the nanoscale, we did a lot of molecular dynamic simulations, always with brittle model materials, um, so that the length scale is quite small at which the particles form. And here you can see a 2D uh, simulation with periodic boundaries. We started from two rough surfaces, put the surface together with a normal load, and slide them. And during sliding, they form contacts, and at the contacts, they form wear, a wear particle. In this case, there's a single wear particle. The wear particle forms. We define the wear volume here as the volume of the particle, because it cannot leave the system due to the periodic boundary conditions. In reality, it would, of course, at some point leave, and then that's what we could call the wear volume. What we can also find is that if this particle is rolling, it's always growing. And indeed, there are mechanical arguments for that, which you can find in the third paper below. I'm not going to go into details on that today. But 2D simulations might be a bit too simple. Also, having only a single particle is too simple, because we kind of wanted to study how do these particles interact. And that is why we went to 3D. Um, but what we did is we started already by introducing particles. The reason is these simulations are very expensive. And with this, we can save some time uh, because we already have a nice picture or a very good picture of how do the particles form. So now we want to look at how they evolve. And here we started with 16 rigid particles, applied a normal load and started sliding, as you can see here in the video. And what you can also see in the video is that these particles keep rolling and they pick up volume from the surfaces and they are coated with this volume. And since they are not embedded into one of the surfaces, and since they are not really scratching, we kind of say this is more of an adhesive wear, despite the particles being rigid. So while the particles continue rolling, they keep picking up volume as expected. We have a relatively low frictional force, and they grow mostly lateral to the sliding direction, because there is basically empty space, there's no obstacle to the growth. So that's why they form these cylinders that you can see here, in a top view and in the bottom row of images. This has been observed before ex situ uh, in experiments that they find these sort of cylindrical rollers, mostly in brittle and quasi brittle materials. Here, for example, silica. But what we can already learn from the simulations is that this regime is not necessarily stable because if these particles touch, they form adhesive bridges and that suppresses the rolling, as you can see in the video. This is also connected to a very high friction force. So now let's look at the wear of the system. Again, wear volume is defined as the volume of these particles. And what you can see here in the highlighted regime, this highlighted regime is when they roll. Again, we see only growth of the particles. Only when we have this regime where they stick together, uh, then we have a stagnation of the wear volume. This is because volume is exchanged bidirectionally between the layer and the surfaces. So you kind of have some sort of equilibrium of, of matter flow. But this is not very interesting because what we care about is when it wears. So there you can already see some parts of these curves are more or less linear. 
sliding this volume over sliding distance, linear relation, so you could apply Archard's square law. Often it's thought that such macroscopic empirical laws can also be applied at the nanoscale. But here you can already see it's a bit um, subjective where you put this linear fit, and then you get different values. And the slopes are quite similar. That means for different loads, you get similar wear uh, rates. And that means your k, your wear coefficient, which should be the same for the same system under different loads, is changing for this. So Archard's wear law is not really applicable. So we went back to the more basic uh, work, tangential work-related law, but we, s we found that it has to be less efficient. We already saw in the 2D simulations the uh, wear due to the particle rolling is much less efficient or is much lower than the particle formation. This gives you a much bigger wear volume. So you kind of have to give it an efficiency uh, parameter. And for this we thought, okay, if the particle encounters an obstacle on a rough surface, it will wear this obstacle off. So you have probably more wear when the surface has more roughness. And so we put this into a parameter here, hrms over g. hrms is the rms of heights and g is an approximation of the particle diameter. And so you can see that with this we can indeed fit the whole regime, the whole rolling regime, even the running in phase, with only a single fit parameter parameter of this k prime. Um, and the k prime is quite close to unity. What it means that it's quite close to unity is that you're not really missing any big parameters in your formula, um, which is very nice. So we can really relate all of this behavior to the surface roughness. And with this, I'm going to finish our excursion into the nanoscale and give you the following take home message for this. You have rolling particles and they always grow. This growth has a certain efficiency. More roughness means more wear related to this HRMS over G parameter, which we found in the steady state for our simulations to be on the order of one to 10%. You can then view the asperity asperity collision, which then leads to the particle formation as a limit of this, because each asperity kind of represents both HRMS, so the roughness, and the particle size, so they're equal, making this much more efficient, 10 to 100 times more efficient than the growth of the particle. But this is a representative volume element, so it only describes what happens at a very small uh, area of the surface. And basically all these processes will be happening all over the surface during a macroscopic wear. And so we need mesoscale modeling. Again, we need to simplify a little bit. And the simplification is going to be, we will, we will only look at the wear particle formation as a source of, of wear and not at the further evolution of the particles, because this is much, much harder to model. So the first approach was done by Luca Frego with boundary element method modeling. We basically made contact maps. And on these contact maps, you can basically see all these junctions that form, and you can look at their size. And then you can color them here. If they are bigger than the critical size, you color them red. If they're smaller than that, you color them yellow. And then you define the wear coefficient, basically of the ratio of red area divided by red plus yellow area, which is the real contact area. And if you increase the load, you get more and bigger contacts. And if you increase it more, you get even more and even bigger contacts. Unfortunately, you can see uh, from this graph that the K is not constant in a load range, which would be the expectation from experiment. And also it's going asymptotically towards one, which is way too high. So K should be below 0.1, maybe even less. Furthermore, if you increase your D star, your wear coefficient goes down. Well, so what? The problem is D star in this formulation that we use is inversely proportional to the square of the hardness. Means harder materials wear more in this model. Now this is not good. Also, again, K is not constant over the load range. So we are missing something here. And to see what we're missing, let's look again at the same thing. Basically, we'll have an excerpt of a big surface where I colored uh, the contacts according to the criterion. Do they wear off or don't they wear off? And we have a rough on rough contact. 
And then we start the same way. We look at all of these contacts that form particles. We estimate which wear volume they would all contribute and we write this in our wear volume over sliding distance graph. But then we slide one of the surfaces against the other and look again at the contact map. And these contacts that form wear particles, they don't disappear immediately. They just change a little bit. But if you count them again, you count way too much wear volume. These have already contributed. So instead you're not counting them, so they're grayed out, and your wear volume stays constant here with the sliding distance. But what happens, of course, is that new contacts form during the sliding process. And here's another one, so you have two contacts here marked by arrows that have just recently formed, and they grow. And they grow and keep growing until they reach the critical size. And when they reach the critical size, we say now they form a particle, and now we count that in the wear volume. And again, that happens there, forms a particle, is counted, and then not counted again. So you get a nice wear volume over sliding distance graph. It looks a bit weird, but it looks a bit weird because we were looking at an excerpt of the surface over a small sliding distance. If you look at the full system over long sliding distance, you get a nice linearity between wear volume and sliding distance, the slope of which is the wear rate. You can then do a lot of these simulations and you will see it's still not perfect. The wear rate over normal load is a bit sublinear, which you can see by the slightly decreasing wear coefficient. But it should be noted that the wear coefficient is much smaller than in the previous approach. And again, 0.1 is not so unreasonable. Some experiments with dry contacts report actually such high wear coefficients. Still it's quite high, often it's lower, but we're getting, we're getting closer. Also a feature of this model is if we reduce the hardness, or here uh, it is expressed in terms of the shear strength of the material tau, but that you can also convert approximately into hardness. So if you decrease that hardness, you get more wear rate. Wear rate increases more and more, the softer your material becomes. And the wear coefficients are not exactly equal, but they are in the same range, which, which is what you would expect from the formulation of Archard's wear law. This is related to this d star. d star gets bigger. That is related to materials getting softer. You wear more. This is the opposite as before, and now much more reasonable. One thing you can observe is that at low loads, your soft material has low wear rates. To understand that, you have to look at the particle formation rate, which basically tells you how many particles per unit sliding distance are formed. And there you can see that the hardest material has the most wear particles. It's just that these wear particles are quite small, so in some, they really result in a low wear volume or low wear rate. But you can also see that at low loads, the softest material has almost no particle formation. And the reason for this is that you need to have junctions that are bigger than d star. And d star is quite big for soft materials. So if you don't put a lot of normal load on this, you will maybe not have many or not any junctions that fulfill the criterion for wear particle formation, which is why you have this low wear regime here. So to summarize this part, we can achieve somewhat realistic uh, values of the wear coefficient without fit parameters. This model doesn't contain any fit parameters. It's only surface morphology, only material parameters. Harder materials in this model wear less. This is expected from experiment. And we can nicely connect a microscopic mechanism represented by this D star, by this fracture criterion for wear particle formation to the number and size of wear particles. And the number and size of wear particles obviously give you the macroscopic wear volume. So to summarize what I told you today, when two asperities come into contact, they form a contact junction with a certain size. This size can, for example, grow during sliding. When it grows big enough to reach a critical size, a wear particle is formed. A wear particle has a certain volume related also to this contact size. And when the wear particle keeps rolling, it can grow. And it can grow with a certain efficiency. This efficiency is related to the roughness of the surfaces on which it is rolling. Furthermore, you can combine this particle formation criterion with a contact map and a model of a sliding process. 
and get a wear law out of this, which gives some qualitatively reasonable results. And with this, I thank you for your attention.